Again, welcome to the table. Today is going to be a great time of revelation. I do believe it's going to be a great time of insight. And so I urge you to pay attention. I urge you, if you don't already, get a piece of paper and some, a pen or a pencil. Get the Word of God because it's going to be a blessing to you here this morning. Now, I want to read out of the, out of the uh, Message Bible. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to read verse, I believe it is uh, four, 14 uh, down through 19. But this is what the Message Bible uh, says. It says, that Paul, he has prayed for all of the followers of Christ that we would experience Jesus, the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. He says, reach out and experience the breadth, exclamation point. Test its length, exclamation point. Plumb the depths, exclamation point. Rise to the heights, exclamation point. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. Now, I want you to, I want to draw our attention to where, when Paul says that we want to, that he's praying for us to experience the extravagant dimensions of Christ. He says, reach out. In other words, he is saying, I want you, I pray that you put forth the effort and experience the breadth exclamation point, test its length, exclamation point, plumb the depths, exclamation point, rise to the heights, exclamation point, live full lives, full in the fullness of God. And each time that we find an exclamation point, it is highlighting what has just been said. So he is highlighting these things. Then it goes on to say, God can do anything you know far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. Exclamation point once again. Now the scripture says in Ephesians 3 and 20, another interpretation puts it like this. God is able to do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and dreams. I hope you understand it. I want to read that once again. Ephesians 3 and 20, another interpretation of this. God is able to do super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare to ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and dreams. When that word infinitely is used, it means that there is no end. There is no end to it. Now, not long ago, I made a certain statement. And I want to read this statement again. I said, the more we focus on something, whatever it may be, the more that it becomes our reality. The more it becomes written into the neural connections of our brain. The more we think about something, the more dominant, the more powerful, the more influential it becomes. Any thought, the longer it is allowed in the brain, will become influential. Now, I said all that to say this. The more we focus on the miraculous, the more of a reality it becomes, the more dominant it becomes. So once again, you ought to write this down at the very beginning. The more we focus on the miraculous, the more of a reality it becomes, the more dominant it becomes. The longer it is allowed in the brain, it will become influential. Influential. So what am I saying? is that as kingdom citizens, for months now, God has moved upon me to talk about the miraculously miraculous, to believe God for higher things, 
to believe God for greater things. That we no longer try to figure out God in our left portion of brain. That we remove the top, remove the cap, and go for the gusto. Now, has it ever occurred to you? I thought about this several weeks ago. Has it ever occurred to you what kind of miracle it took to provide for Israel in the wilderness? Have you ever thought about that? Well, if you haven't, listen tightly. Feeding Israel in the wilderness. We are talking about three and a half million people plus large flocks and herds of animals. According to the quartermaster general in the army, he said Moses would have had to have 1,500 tons of food each day. That's each day, 1,500 tons of food. It would take two freight trains, each a mile long, to feed that many people each and every single day. What about cooking? They would need 4,000 tons of firewood and a few more freight trains, each a mile long, just for one day. What about water? A person's water requirements would have been 20 quarts per day. It is thought Israel would have needed up to 11 million gallons of water each day to drink, wash themselves, and clean dishes. This would be equivalent of a freight train of tank cars, watch this, 1,800 miles long, just to bring the water. What about space in the Red Sea? Israel crossed the Red Sea in just one night. One night. If they went on a narrow part, double file, the line would be 800 miles long, and it would take 35 days and nights to get through it. So there had to be a space in the Red Sea three miles wide they would have to walk across 5,000 abreast to get over in just one night. Every time they camped at the end of the day, a campground two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island would be needed. That, com that comprises an area of 25 miles wide, 30 miles long, or a total of 750 square miles. This space was just for camping nightly. And so, just for an added bonus, it took 40 hours for Israel to get out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. But now we're talking about, when you read, when you hear me read all of these statistics of what it took to provide for Israel and take care of Israel in the desert, we're talking about a miraculous power. We're talking about the unprecedented, the unimaginable. But God is always a God over the top. He's more than enough, as the scripture says. You see, in the early ministry of Jesus, time after time, people, watch this, they came to Jesus for a miracle. They dared to ask for the impossible. They dared to ask for the unthinkable. They dared to ask for the far-fetched. They even dared to ask for the unachievable. And because they dared to ask, they received the unthinkable. They received the far-fetched. And they received the unattainable. Last year, I read where a prominent pastor said, when God gives you a miracle, you up the ante. You believe God for a bigger miracle. You then start believing God for bigger and bigger miracles. I'm totally convinced God wants us to believe Him for the unthinkable. He wants us to believe for the unimaginable. He wants us to believe for the unattainable, the unreachable. 
for that which seems that it's impossible to get a hold of, that we dare to not only ask for, but believe for. You see, some time ago, God moved upon me to teach. Impossible odds sets the stage for, a mir for a amazing miracles. And we are in a season, I believe, we need to not only hear it again, but be reminded of impossible odds sets the stage for amazing miracles. And that's what I'm going to once again be talking about and teaching to you here this morning. Because I just felt like God is saying, again, I say unto you. So once again, I want you to get ready. And I want you to receive this all over again. Because invariably, when you hear it again, you're going to say, you're going to say something like, you know what? I missed that last time. Or I didn't see that last time. Or I didn't hear that last time. And so once again, we are bringing to you impossible odds sets the stage for amazing miracles. Get ready. Here it is. Good morning and praise the Lord once again. I want to say that uh, I thank you for allowing me this time to be able to bring you a very fresh word from Almighty God, which I do believe on this Sunday morning that God is going to use me to further and expand your faith and put it into a new dimension that He desires for it to be. I do believe in these last days that the latter house is going to be greater than the former. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that. I want to be right in the middle of what God is doing and going to do and has a desire to do in these last days. Now, with that said, Oh, and I want to thank you for allowing me this time to come into your home and wherever you may be watching. And it is a privilege. I do not take this lightly that you would open your home, open your heart, open wherever you may be to receive a fresh word from God. Now, with that said, we're going to go to three different places in Scripture that God began to highlight to me while I was studying that I believe is going to be a profound connection to the word and the revelation that's going to be coming forth. And so, first of all, we are going to go 2 Samuel chapter 23. And this time I am reading out of the Voice Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 23. We're going to read verses 20, 21, and 22. And then from there, we will go to Isaiah chapter 8, reading verse 20, and then we'll back up to verse 16. For our last portion of reading, we're going to go to Job chapter 26 and verse 14. But for right now, we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 20, 21, and 22. And it goes like this. And there was Benaiah, Jehoda's son, who also did great deeds. He struck down two lion-hearted heroes of Moab. Benaiah also killed a lion in a pit on one snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian who was a powerful looking man. The Egyptian was armed with a spear while Benaiah only had his staff. But he took the spear away from him and killed the Egyptian with his own weapon. These were the kinds of feats Benaiah, the son of Jehoda, performed that won him a name equal to to the three mighty men for bravery. Now I want to stop there. We're going to go to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. We are going to go to chapter 8, reading verse 20 and verse 16. And I want you to please pay close attention the way the Voice Bible puts it. Verse 20. Go to God's teachings and His testimony to guide your thoughts and behavior. Right here in the Voice Bible, it has an exclamation point, which means it, this portion of Scripture, this statement is being highlighted. Go to God's teaching and His testimony to guide your thoughts and behavior. If any response disagrees with the Word of God, 
then it's muddling and wrong and not the least bit illuminating. Verse 16 says, Now take care to keep this message as it is. Take care to keep this message as it is. Now, I want to read just the top portion of verse 20 one more time. It's very important. Go to God's teaching and His testimony to guide your thoughts and behavior. Exclamation point. Now, we're going to go to the book of Job. Job chapter 26 and verse 14. And all of this, all of these are the mere edges of God's capabilities. We are privy to only a whisper of His power. So I want to read that one more time. All of this, all of these are the mere edges of His capabilities. We are privy to only a whisper of God's power. Now, I want to talk to you on what I have entitled Impossible Odds Sets the Stage for Amazing Miracles. Impossible Odds Set the Stage for Amazing Miracles. Now, when we read about Benaiah, about killing the lions, it's very important that we understand a, a lion, which I wrote down in my notes, lion can run up to 35 miles an hour and leap 30 feet in a single bound. Males grow to the lengths of 10 feet. They weigh from 330 pounds to 550 pounds. And so when Benea faced the lions, you could say the odds were stacked against him. So once again, lions can run up to 35 miles an hour and leap 30 feet in a single bound. And when they are mature, they can weigh anywhere from 330 pounds to 550 pounds. That is five times more than what Benea weighed. So once again, you could say the odds were stacked against him. Now, I want to begin with this statement. Impossible odds set the stage for amazing miracles. You ought to write that down. Impossible odds set the stage for amazing miracles. If, what if, and I want, to, I want you to pay close attention. What if the life you want and the future God wants you to have is hiding right now in your biggest problem or your worst failure or your greatest fear? I'll, I will say that again. What if the life you really want and the future God wants you to have is hiding right now in your biggest problem or your worst failure or your greatest fear? So once again, impossible odds sets the stage for amazing miracles. Here's the revelation. When we don't have the guts to step out in faith, we then rob the glory that rightfully belongs to God. Think about that. When we don't have the guts to step out in faith, we then rob the glory that rightfully belongs to God. God is wanting to show His profound glory in these last days to His kingdom citizens. If there's one thing that I am very convinced about, it is that which I have just said that in these closing hours of the church age, that the glory of God is wanting to be unleashed in a greater way than ever before. As kingdom citizens, we are called to look for opportunities in our problems and obstacles. Yes, we are. God has called us to defy the odds. Number two, face our fears. Number three, ref refrain problems or refrain problems. Number four, embrace uncertainty. Number five, seize opportunities. And number six, even to the point of looking foolish. So I say it again. In these last days, God has called you and I as kingdom citizens to defy the odds. 
to face our fears, to reframe problems, to embrace uncertainty, to seize opportunities, even to the point of looking foolish. But you see, far too many times we miss out on the miracle because the enemy tells us, what if you step out there and God isn't there? What if you step out and God isn't there? Sometimes, I want you to hear this, sometimes faith calls for us to take the step or to take risk. You don't think for one moment when the storm was raging and Peter said, Lord, if that you bid me to come, and Peter without a second thought jumped over the edge of that boat and he started walking on waters, that took a risk. Now, I want you to continue listening to this. In the natural, things can look uncertain, but faith removes the uncertainty. You ought to write that down. In the natural, things can look uncertain, but faith removes the uncertainty. When we become determined to not miss out on God, then defying odds and looking foolish will become our default system or our default settings. In other words, it will become normal for you. Once again, defying odds and looking foolish will become default settings in your life. In other words, it will become normal for you to defy the odds, even to the point of looking foolish. That's what I'm talking about here. In Psalms 145 in verse 3, it tells us, His greatness knows no limit, recognizes no boundaries. No one can measure or comprehend His greatness. When I read that, I was drawn to that this morning. His greatness knows no limit, recognizes no boundaries. No one can measure or comprehend His greatness. One of the most important things about you and I is what comes to mind when we think about God. One of the most important things about you and I is when we think about God, what comes to mind? A.W. Tozer said this, The most important fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be. How we think about God will determine who we become. How we think about God will determine what we see and don't see in our life. I want to say that again. How we think about God will determine who we become. But at the same time, how we think about God will determine what we will see or what we will not see. Or I could put it like this, what we will personally experience or what we personally will not experience. And that internal picture of God determines how we see everything else. So I must say that again. How we think about God will determine who we become. We are a God, we are a product of our God picture. Yes, we are. We are a product of our God picture picture. And that right there, internal picture of God, determines how we see everything else. Most of our problems are not circumstantial. Most of our problems are not circumstantial. Most of our problems, watch this, are perceptual. Our biggest problem can be traced back to an inadequate understanding of who God is. You see, when Israel, yes, before God led them out of Egypt, they were eyewitness of the miraculous power of God against the Egyptians and Pharaoh. 
But once they came out, God led them to Mount Sinai. And it was there that God stopped and gave them the Ten Commandments, or according to the Hebrew Bible, the Ten Directives of God. God was establishing His personality to Israel. He was establishing who He was and what He would put up with and would not put up with. You see, by the time that that generation came out of Egypt, it had been 400 years. And each year, the identity of who Israel was, the purpose of Israel, and the God of Israel began to diminish each year or as each generation came and gone. And so within a new generation, it got to where that last generation had taken on the customs and the ideas of the Egyptians. That is why when Israel, God led Israel out of Egypt, that there came a time that Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. They had been physically delivered, but Egypt was still in their heart. And so God had to establish who he really was. You see, I truly believe that the majority of kingdom citizens, the only thing that they know about God is what they have read in the eternal word of God. As seeing and being an eyewitness of the miraculous power of God in any given situation is foreign to a lot of people because they settle, they settle in the kingdom of God. And I have always told a young couple that I have married, you can have a plain Jane marriage or you can have a great marriage. It takes work on having a great knowledge or a great marriage. And so at the same time, the Bible says, and I've used this before, and I taught it uh, last Sunday, the deep calls unto the deep. There is a language, there is a voice that is desiring to reach another voice that is in the deep. It wants to be relatable. It wants to be reached for. It wants to be grabbing a hold of. And so in the kingdom of God, we find that where Peter said, and I believe it's the second Peter writings to where he makes it plain. We were eyewitness of the glory of God. And when I read that, it really got a hold of me. And I began to seek God. I began to go after God in a way that I had not previously. And I began to pray, God, I want my family and I to be an eyewitness of your glory, an eyewitness of your miraculous power. And I want to stop right here and say that I pray that it will somehow, through this teaching this morning, that your faith will be ignited, that there will be a hunger that will be ignited or maybe reborn that you've lost, but you're going to recapture it through this teaching this morning to go after God in such a way that you have not previously, that you too will want to become an eyewitness of the glory of God. I'm telling you, it is the desire of God for His people to become an eyewitness of His glory. Peter was an eyewitness. John was an eyewitness. And James was an eyewitness. And the other disciples were an eyewitness. But those three, Peter, James, and John, they moved into a place. God allowed them to be an eyewitness that the others were not capable of being privy to. They, those three was on the top of the mountain as known to today as the transfiguration. They saw things that was unspeakable. They experienced things that really changed their life. Their life was never the same when they walked back down that mountain. And God wants to move us into a time and place in this last season that our lives will never be the same, never be the same. I'm telling you, the miraculous is ours if we want it, if we desire it, if we go after it, if we seek it, 
It is ours. Some of this I repeated or I said last week, but I'll repeat it again because as I said, this is where God has me at, is looking and seeking and going after the miraculous power of God, the glory of God being demonstrated in the Jackson family. Now, Tozer also went on to say, a low view of God is caused by a hundred lesser evils, but a person with a high view of God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. You see, the more we grow spiritually, the bigger our God needs to get in our life. I'll say that again. The more we grow spiritually in God, then the bigger He ought to become in our life. Did you know that astronomers have spied galaxies 12.3 billion light years from the Earth? To put the distance into perspective, consider the fact that light traveling 186,000 miles per second only takes eight minutes to travel the 93 million miles between the sun and the planet Earth. So therefore, sunlight is only eight minutes old. So I want to repeat this again because I'm bringing us somewhere by using these examples. Astronomers have spied galaxies 12.3 billion light years from the Earth. To put the distance into perspective, consider the fact that light traveling 186,000 miles per second only takes eight minutes to travel the 93 million miles between the sun and the planet Earth. As I said, sunlight is only eight minutes old. But light from the furthest galaxy takes 12.3 billion years to get here. And here's the thing. Our God says that is about the distance between His thoughts and our thoughts. I have said before, our best thought about God on our best day falls 12.3 billion light years short of how great God is. Oh my God. You see, I have learned God has allowed me to study about quantum physics and the depth and length of it, about atoms, and then about the coming across these astronomers and what they have discovered. And then God uses it to say that that is the distance between my thoughts and your thoughts. And that how that the best thought about God on our best day falls 12.3 billion light years short of how great God is. Now, taking that into perspective, then it should give us an understanding a supernatural knowledge of how big our God is. I have stated before behind this black desk that when our God does something, He goes over and above. What was it that the Apostle Paul stated? That our God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything that we would ask or even comprehend. When God does something, He does it over the top. Our God is an extravagant God. But I believe that so many kingdom citizens have had a small view of God. I truly believe that. And so therefore, it is imperative in these last days for us to have a bigger view of God than we've ever had before. Because as I said, God is wanting to expand our supernatural understanding. He wants to expand it. He wants to take our faith in new dimensions. 
Notice I said an S, a new dimensions. God is wanting to expand our revelation. He's wanting to expand our knowledge of how great, good, and big, and extravagant He is. It is time for us to have a bigger view of God than ever before, than ever before. I have said, and I think I said it last Sunday, that as kingdom citizens, it is imperative that we take out the word impossible out of our vocabulary, out of our vocabulary. Even the word if, even the word but, because remember when Satan appeared to Jesus, when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, remember what he said, if thou be the son of God, if he threw that if in there, which means the word if means something that is not concrete. It's still up in the air. And when it comes to believing in God, that is why I say for us to remove the word if, because when it comes to the eternal word of God, it's not something that's up in the air, but it is concrete. It is solid. And when we operate in faith, we must operate in a concrete faith, in a positive faith, in a faith that has and leaves no limits, no limits at all. Now let us continue. This is what I said. We underestimate God's greatness by at least 12.3 billion light years. The bigger God gets, the smaller our problems become. The bigger God gets, the smaller our problems become. When we are rooted, that's the thing, when we are rooted in the sovereignty of God, we can pray the unthinkable and believe the impossible. I hope you just caught that. When we are rooted in the sovereignty of God, we can pray the unthinkable and believe the impossible. Maybe I need to stop right here and challenge somebody that you are afraid to pray the unthinkable because you think that it will, that you will not receive the impossible. And so you don't want to go there. Friend of mine, I'm telling you, or could it be that I'm speaking to somebody right now that you have at one particular time, you stepped out on faith, but things didn't change. And so now you are past possessed because you can't move forward in God because of that. You think to yourself, I've tried that. I stepped out on faith and it didn't change anything. And you see that right there is what the enemy wants you to believe. He wants, he wants to highlight that in front of your face to where you can't get around it. That that's all you see that you feel like God did not get your back, that God let you down. But here's the thing. It's like when the prophet of God spoke that a rain was coming that a downpour was on its way and he goes to the top of the mountain and he puts his head between his legs and begin to pray. He begins to seek God and he tells the servant to go look and see and come back and report to me. What do you see? And seven different times the servant comes back and tells the prophet, I don't see anything, but I want you to pay attention to something. And here's the thing that the prophet of God, when the servant came back the first time, he says, I don't see nothing. He told him, he said, go again. And so he went, comes back. I still don't see anything. And then he tells him to go again. And on the eighth time that he comes back, he says, well, I see a cloud, but it's about the size of a, of a man's hand, which no doubt he was not that excited about telling the prophet of God, I see a cloud, but it's only about the size of a man's hand. Can you imagine up in the sky, as big as it is, the vastness of, of the heavens, and all he sees is just the size of a man's hand. And so no doubt the, the servant came back, and he wasn't really all that faith-filled. He wasn't really all that enthused, and he just probably just kind of threw it out there. Well, I, I now see a size of a man's hand, 
But that is all the prophet needed to hear. And he jumps up with excitement and he outruns the chariot. What am I saying? Is that the Lord has taught us about not giving up, about having persistence when it comes to standing in faith, persistence when it comes to prayer. He used a great example as to say, this is what you need to do. It's when the woman came before the unjust judge and she was warning that judge to avenge her of her adversary. And the Bible tells us he could care less about her. He had business to take, to take care of her, of, uh, of himself. He had business to take care of, and he looked at her as just some little old peon. But she would not take no for an answer. She didn't get discouraged, turn around, and go back home with her head tucked between her tail end. No, she stayed there and kept on till finally the judge said, this woman is driving me crazy. Bring her before me. And so right under that, the Lord began to teach us about the persistence of prayer. That's why he put that parable in his word. He wanted us to look at that and have that same attitude as that woman. Don't give up. If it doesn't happen the first time, don't get discouraged, but keep at it until it happens. Keep at it until God moves. Keep at it until the glory of God is released. And so I want to just encourage somebody that the devil has had you to a place to where you've not wanted to pray for certain things because you have said, well, I, I did that. I felt like I stuck my neck out and nothing happened. The devil is a lie. So once again, I encourage you to go back, pick up the word of God, pick up the faith of God, pick up faith in you and go back and start decreeing. Remember what the scripture says, and I've used it so many times behind this black desk. You shall decree a thing and it shall be established. It shall be established. Oh my God, there have been times in my years of ministry, that I have prayed for certain things. And it didn't happen instantly, but I kept on praying. I kept on praying. Years ago, years ago, when I went to Israel the first time, and I was standing before the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, and I wrote on my piece of paper that I wanted to see the glory of God. And while I lived in New Braunfels, I folded it up. I stuck it between the wall. And did you know that it didn't happen instantly? And that I went through a process to where the devil really tried to destroy my faith and make me believe that what I had asked God to do was never going to come to pass. But one year before COVID hit and everything shut down, I started seeing the very thing that I had wrote down on that piece of paper years ago. And I started seeing it for 12 months. I, I just was an eyewitness to the miraculous power of God. What am I saying? I am saying that don't quit praying. Don't give up. The Bible says that the first time that God, that you started praying, God heard you. And how I know that is in the book of Daniel, the Bible says that Daniel prayed for 21 days because he had a vision and he wanted to get the interpretation of it. And when he broke through, the angel Gabriel came and said that I have come because of your words. The reason I'm standing here, the reason that there was a breakthrough was because of what came out of your mouth. Did you hear what I just said? What came out of your mouth? He said, I'm here because of your words. He said, the very first time that you set your heart to pray, God heard you. And that is an encouragement for somebody here this morning. You can have a breakthrough with your circumstance to where the angel of God will come because of your words, because of you decreeing and declaring. So I urge you this morning to go back and start reclaiming what God first told you. 
Reclaim it. Start once again decreeing and declaring the Word of God because God is not a liar. God is not the author of confusion. God will show Himself strong. Yes, He will. He will show Himself strong in your life. No matter what circumstance that you may be facing right now, no matter what situation that you may be in right now, God wants to release His glory. He wants to release His power and show you that you become an eyewitness of the miraculous power of God. Yes, He does. He wants to change that situation. He wants to change that circumstance. Now, once again, when we are rooted in the sovereignty of God, we can pray the unthinkable and believe for the impossible. You see, in 2 Kings, a group of prophets are chopping down some trees near a river, and all of a sudden, one of the prophets' axe head falls into the river. And when it falls into the river, the young prophet panics, and he runs to Elisha and says, tells him what's happened. He said, I borrowed that uh, axe head. Now, I want to want to slow down here because I want you to get this. You see, any mineral with a density greater than one gram per cubic centimeter doesn't float. The density of cast iron is 7.2 grams per cubic centimeter. Simply put, iron axe heads don't float. Or do they? Or do they? You see, the only way to find out is to pray a ridiculous prayer and then believe for a ridiculous miracle. So I shall say that again. Iron axe heads really are not supposed to float. But this one did. And the only way for you to find out if the axe head floats in your life is to pray a ridiculous prayer and then believe for a ridiculous miracle. Earlier this year, I think it might have been even last year, I taught on the subject, I double dog dare you. And so it comes to me once again, I double dog dare you to pray a ridiculous prayer and then believe for a ridiculous miracle. A double dog dare you to do it. You see, several weeks ago, I was outside walking and praying, and I prayed for a good 45 minutes to be an eyewitness of the glory of God. And so I walked back inside. I sat down in my chair, and I just opened to the book of Judges, and I came right upon the chapter to where Samson kills a thousand, a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Great victory, a great victory. But when he was finished, he had such a ravenous thirst. He was thirsty, so thirsty. But at the same time, there was no stream around. There was no pond for him to drink out of. There was no lake. There was nothing. So he took it to God, and suddenly, from a rock, water began to flow. It was God's way. When I read that, it was God's way of letting me know the miraculous can happen anytime, any place, and from any source. Then he told me this, look for it. Look for it. You see, I had just been praying to be an eyewitness of the glory of God. And then I walk in and I, I'm not looking for it. It's not even on my mind about Samson. And I open my, the Bible and I start reading right there. It's where my eyes fail. 
And it wasn't by accident. It wasn't by happen chance. It was God's way of telling me the miraculous can happen anytime, any place, and from any source. And then I felt him tell me, start looking for it. And so I want to challenge you. I want to make it personable. I want to tell you that the miraculous can happen anytime, any place, and from any source. And you need to start looking for it. When it comes to God, there are no degrees of difficulty. There are no odds when it comes to God. Why? All bets are off. All bets are off. I will go a little step further and say, five plus two does not equal seven. On that day, I emphasize that day, Jesus was going to feed 5,000 with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And when he made that known, when he said, what do you have? You could see the disciples start crunching the numbers. Each loaf or each fish is equal to one meal. The odds were 5,000 to 7. You still come up with 4,993 meals short. But on that singular day, the Lord defied the odds. They came up with more than what they had in the beginning. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 14, it reads, In a single day, God moved on Israel. I read that this morning when I first sat down to study. That's what I found. That's what I saw on a single day. And I wrote, what can God do in one single day? For Rebecca in the Old Testament, in one single day, God completely altered her destiny. And I ask you, what is God fixing to do for you in one single day? What is God fixing to do for you in one single day? That single, that one single day will give you more than what you have now. Just as the water flowed out of a rock for Samson, look for the miraculous to happen in an unexpected place. Look for the miraculous to happen in an unexpected place. Place because impossible odds set the stages for amazing miracles. You see, in closing, I go back to what I just said about that one single day. One single day. I've said it before. There's so many others, examples. But the reason that I go back to Rebecca is because I was praying about that earlier this year, in around December. And so, in one single day, when she got up that single day, on that particular morning, she had no idea that that day was going to change her life, that her whole destiny was going to be altered. And not only that, her family, because the servant brought ten camels that were weighted down with all kinds of goods all kinds of purple and scarlet material and jewelry. And there was a dowry that the servant had to pay the family in order to receive Rebecca. And so even her family, the des their destiny was altered on one particular day. Here's what I'm saying. God led me to that this morning to tell all of us that he has destined. I, oh my God, I feel prophecy on me right now that he has destined. He has set aside one single day that is going to alter our lives completely. And we are going to have more after that than what we have right now. God has set aside. Once again, let me make it personal because I feel the Lord on me right now. God has set aside 
one singular day for you, that one singular day that is going to change your life forever, that is going to change your destiny. And you're going to have more than what you have now. I, I feel that God led me that to that particular place this morning. He led it to me. And once again, we find in Isaiah, go to God's teaching and his testimony to guide your thoughts and behavior and behavior that our behavior even speaks out that I expect that one single day to happen. That's going to change everything in my life. That's going to give me more than what I have now. That my behavior is going to change. That my behaviors, I'm going to, it's going to be showing God that I'm going to be expecting the miraculous to happen at any place, at any moment, in any time. And here is what I'm saying. It will happen. It's not going to happen. It is happened. God's already said it in the heavenlies. He's already destined for it to be. He's already assigned it. It has our name on it. It has our name on it. I believe it. I believe it so much. So once again, impossible odds sets the stage for amazing miracles. For Banea, it was impossible. It looked like in the natural that it was impossible that the lion was going to rip him apart. That this Egyptian giant, all he had, Benaiah, all he had was a walking stick. And the giant, the Egyptian giant, had a spear. But instead of Benaiah getting scared and running away, he didn't look at it as, well, these are impossible odds. It never entered that guy's mind because of his actions. And he got close enough to where he took the Egyptian spear away from him. That kind of reminds me of David. You see, let me just stop right here and say that when Satan tries to hoard you with things and keep back things from you, then you need to just snatch it away from him. In the mighty name of Jesus, snatch it away from him. Because the scripture says that he'll have to return it to you sevenfold. 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 And so once again, with the anointing of God upon me, that God is wanting to expand our faith. God is wanting us to know that we serve a big God, that we serve an extravagant God, and that He will move not on somebody else, but we will be able to see it in our life, in our life, because that's His desire. That's what He's designed for you and I. So once again... Impossible odds sets the stage for amazing miracles. And beloved, I prayed for every one of you this morning that as this word went forth, that it would spur you, that it would reignite faith in somebody to believe God again for the impossible. Take that word impossible out of your vocabulary. Take the word if out of your vocabulary. Take the word but out of your vocabulary. Let your faith be sure and concrete. Let it be such a strong conviction. Let faith become a strong conviction. That it becomes who you are. It gets down into your soul, the depths of your soul, that it becomes your personality. And so keep your head up. Keep your knees bent. And remember, this is the year of Gimel. I'm expecting the camels. Look for the camels. And remember, impossible odds sets the stage for amazing miracles. God bless you.